At 7.52 on this Friday morning, it is time to turn our attention to rugby and Ronan O'Gara is on the line. Ronan, good morning to you. Hi, hey, Owen. Hi, Adrian. How are you? Yeah, very well. Big weekend this weekend for yourselves, playing two lose. Uh, five wins on the bounce for your team at the moment, only one defeat in your last nine. I presume that just leads to the sense of momentum rolling up against one of the best teams in the top 14. Yeah, it does, exactly. Um and uh, yeah, nine o'clock tomorrow night in the stadium, so it's a football stadium in Toulouse, so it's not their home ground. So uh, it's been sold out since whatever a few weeks, and um, uh, it's a bit of a bogey team for us, I suppose. Toulouse, and the fact that since um, one of the last two seeds, we played them five times and we haven't uh, managed to get the better of them. So um, there's an opportunity to hopefully. And do something with that tomorrow night, but as you say, at home, it's it's in their home, it's, it's not easy. But we're in good form, there's a good buzz in our camp, and uh, the boys seem to be enjoying it. And that's uh, why you get involved in sport for opportunities like this. So we go down there, um, looking to play. What have you learned over those five games in terms of trying to stop those half backs that everybody obviously talks about with two lose? It's weird in the fact on that the show goes on, you know, like losing two finals, it feels nearly like five years ago in, in my mind and the fact that it's, it's yet so near yet so far because when you consider we lost four of our five first league games the kind of under the pump in terms of selections and needing points and I suppose your mindset has to be a little bit different because you need to get in the top six and I don't know how closely you're following it this year but like it's, I don't think there's ever been a top 14 like it where we're three games away from the end of the regular season and nine teams can qualify for for the six positions so there's uh i suppose huge excitement over here for that competition um because the bookly is bigger than the european cup um so we need to be in the top six uh you look at it i think if Toulouse win this weekend they'll be equal points with us uh and both of us are kind of tr- looking to scram scramble into a into it uh, because Montpellier are, are, uh, are ahead and little things I suppose become big things at this stage of season one and two go straight to a semi-final um, so while um, it's still possible for us obviously if we were to win our remaining three games which is entirely doable um, but um, uh, going back I suppose to where we started we have momentum and uh, I think we're, we're playing well and we gave our French internationals kind of the weekend off last week a lot of them got away to the States and uh, I think Tunisia for a bit of a break so they've come in this week and added a little bit of energy and we need that now for, for, for the final I suppose uh, running uh, We were speaking to you a few weeks ago Ronan and I think after the first of the three games against Bordeaux and obviously there was the, the situation in terms of you were going to go in front of a hearing to see whether there be any disciplinary action taken over the, the next little while. You seemed totally relaxed about it at the time that the team was, was going to be able to, that it wasn't even an issue whatsoever for the team. W- was that the truth? W- was that exactly how you felt, given that you did end up winning all three games? Did, did you know it was going to be okay, basically? No, because you're never sure, because you're not de- you're dealing with emotions and you're dealing with human beings, and that's the sport, you know. I think uh, that's what makes it so fascinating. It's the same as goal kicking as in, in some, I suppose, components for me. Some days you're practicing, you feel like the exact same te- technique, and it's so easy, and you can nearly do it with your eyes closed, and then you go other days, and you're kind of pushing the ball right in your left, and you're going, why are you doing that? Because it's you feel like you're doing exactly the same, I suppose, process or steps or cues, uh, to do it and it's the same with coaching a team and the fact that you're just kind of hoping for transfer I suppose what was evident for me in my early days in La Rochelle was, was how do we expect to play well on Saturday if we're not going well Monday to Friday well I think at now we kind of have I suppose um, a, a few components of our game are strong which you can rely on when pressure comes on and then you see that on a Saturday um, so the Bordeaux game, the big game, was obviously the, the league game. Um, and then we went into um, Europe, a back-to-back, which was the first time, obviously, as you know, in that competition. And we played on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Um, Saturday at 2 o'clock um, down there. And it was our best performance of the season so far. We, we, we walloped them. Uh, 
but we played it, I suppose, a high tempo game with a lot of intensity, with a lot of, I suppose, uh, physical uh, players, which put what 20, well, not end up be, us being 18 points ahead for the second leg, which meant nearly the second game was dead if, if we started well, which uh, we couldn't have been probably more unimpressive for the first 40 minutes at home, but we kind of regrouped at half time and, and I wouldn't say fell across the line, but uh, got the job done. Uh, really well in the fact that we could make changes for Perpignan, which was the game the week after. But in that game, we made a lot of changes and we didn't get the bonus points offensively. So, you know, you're always scratching your head a little bit because it's never straightforward. Did you get to give uh, Christoph Urias, did you get to have that glass of wine or did you give him a thumbs up after the trilogy was over? No, I think it was a good message in the fact that... Uh, you know, over here, some people, I suppose, just love talking to the media. He'd be one of them. Uh, what was important for me, the supporters, the club, I think, was it was 3 0. We'd see them again this season, so there'd be, it was a bigger day ahead as well. So, uh, you know, I think I keep reminding the players and ourselves that we're in the business of high performance. So that's what we need to do. Uh, can I ask from your pre match analysis of Toulouse for this weekend, does that give you? hope that Munster will have a better outcome against them this season than they did in Europe last season? Whoa, I never even think like that. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. enough in my face. It's like, uh, the reality, I suppose, when you're managing 40 players and trying to get the best out of them, and you got to remember, every time you announce 23, you know what I mean? 40% of your group are bitterly disappointed and, and aren't really open to you for the next 48 hours because you've disappointed them. You've essentially... You know what I mean? Stuff the dagger into their heart because this is what they do. This is what makes them feel good by representing their club and, and showing what they can bring. And by you doing that, you don't give them that opportunity. So I have to manage, I suppose, uh, their emotions. And that's the most important thing in players and the fact that if they're feeling good, average, top, miserable, it's very different for every single one. And you multiply that by... 40 players and 30 staff, uh, you got to get, a, I suppose, be very, uh, pretty good at processing emotions uh, and making decisions on the run in terms of how you, I suppose, can get your your troops on side with you for, for the weekend. So what we will do is we, what we do every week is that we look at the opposition and we look at uh, their threats and uh, the preparation genuinely for Perpignan, it would be the same as it is for Toulouse, but what is noticeable is that Toulouse have uh, more threats than Perpignan and they have the greatest threat in the game in DuPont. So, yeah, we have a system, a defensive system, which won't change this weekend, but will it be tested? Yes, most definitely, because you've got a guy who's, uh, I suppose, who's very capable and regularly breaks a lot of rules and makes his team... Um, and himself look better than so many other players in the world. So we know where they've threats. They've ten Grand Slam of the twenty, of ten of the twenty-three of the Grand Slam winning team. Uh, they have a lot of exceptional individuals. But I suppose what I'm trying to convince our guys and and myself is that the you know the the strength of the group uh, and the strength of the team and uh, believing in our fundamentals can can overpower uh, individual threats. How is he breaking rules? Is it around the fringes, or what are you seeing? Yeah, exactly, Adrian. You know, like it's it's. There's nothing on. There's nothing on, and then all of a sudden, bang off his left foot, bang off his right foot, fend, and he's gone. And like what people underestimate, it's not. You know I mean, with, with, with the greatest of respect, it's not Peter Stringer who's carrying the ball. It's a guy who's incredibly powerful. You know what I mean? It's probably. Uh, you mean there's probably similarities between uh, Brian O'Driscoll near the line to Dupont with the ball. You know that's that's how much of a wow. of a of a dangerous ball carrier he is. He's got incredible power and he's got in very very good footwork. But I think what's probably been under appreciated by a lot of people is his uh, his kicking meters. I think in the England game that he kicked for 600 meters in the game alone, which you know, his capacity to kick off either foot from 22 to 22 is, is a good tool to have.
And is it the, the that power, I suppose, might be underestimated to a degree by opposition, although increasingly you would wonder how that might be the case, but the is it almost against the referees are underestimating that they're like, oh, here's this nippy scrum half and you give him a bit of leeway and he's you give him an inch and he's taking a mile? Who? The referee? Yeah, well, in the sense of the when you're saying about him breaking the rules or whatever and been able to get away with that. No, no, sorry, bre- no, nothing, sorry. There's a mis- misunderstanding there in terms of we have defensive rules, sorry, in terms of how we kind of set up around the rock. So there's kind of certain, I suppose, Q's criteria, uh, fundamentals you give your players around a rock and rugby, what they've got to do, you know. Mm. So for us, uh, we could still be in place, and Dupont could actually break our rules. Pardon okay. is what I'm trying to explain, you know, and the fact that we're in place, there doesn't seem to be a gap, and all of a sudden, uh, he's gone. And once he breaks the front line, then you're in trouble. Uh, Ronald, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the situation at Munster at the moment. Uh, have you seen a, a bit of a better vein of form from Munster, a bit of a better version of Munster since there's been just a little bit more clarity in the coaching situation over the last little while? I'm not too sure. Uh, is it linked? But what I think is very obvious was uh, how well they played against Munster. I watched that game but its entirety last weekend and um, Munster looked very, very good. Uh, I suppose the one... Uh, surprise was when they were so on top that they didn't kick on but then I suppose I had to remind myself the game was in in the Kingspan and it was Ulster a a very good team in front of them but Munster I suppose really had um, the upper hand early enough in the game they defended really well their attack with Dialandi and Carberry looked uh, very very interesting and they played with a lot more width than usual I thought but I'm not uh, watching them every week for 80 minutes so I have to be accurate in what I say as well but they uh, I, I think they they look like they played a little bit more freely and they I think definitely reduced the amount of times uh, they, they box kicked but um, they looked uh, they looked very sharp they looked uh, to have threats all over the pitch and um, some of the forwards were, were very impressive uh, is it Kendellen? Is that how you yeah. pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, looks like a, an incredibly exciting prospect. Uh, Gavin Coombs wasn't wasn't involved, so you paired the two of them up with a Peter Romani, with Jack O'Donoghue, uh, with John Klein. Uh, the front row were good against Ulster. So um, it's um, you know I mean they're finding their form at, at exactly the time you need to be finding their form, and uh, the game in, in Dublin um, will be. Um, will be a very, very interesting game. It's looking like Mike Prendergast is going to be the front runner to get the attack coach job and Dennis Leamy obviously linked with the defence coach job for next season's coaching ticket at Munster. How excited would you be about those appointments? Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm obviously, I know the two guys really well, but like I, I uh, have a fair idea that Mike is, is talking to them, but uh, Mike is in contract with, with Rasson, so... You'd hope that um, you know, I mean that Munster understand what that means because it's it's this is the guy they need and um, if there's a guy to get with him, it's Dennis Leamy. Uh, Dennis Leamy left uh, an indelible mark on me as a player, as a person, and uh, I uh, I like that he's a perfect example of a guy with ambition because everyone in Munster was absolutely shocked that Dennis Leamy would go to Leinster uh, to coach. Dennis Leamy is smart. He wants to be world class. He goes to an environment that I think gives people or coaches the potential to be world class with the expertise they have in that building. Um, And if Munster are smart, they'd get this guy because this guy is an absolute gem. I couldn't, I think, give him enough praise. He's... uh, when he spoke in our dressing room, uh, it was so accurate, it was so to point, and it was like, just as I said in the show before, it left you with, oh, please speak more often, Dennis, please speak more often. But I think uh, very, very wise, very, um, very interesting guy. And um, uh, I kind of obviously haven't been following what's going on much at home, uh, but I saw one article where those two were paired up and, uh, for me, that's uh, that's 
the absolute ticket to get excited about these two are, would be a fantastic combination. Right. Uh, like uh, the, the Leamy um, coaching graph is really interesting. I mean, from, from schools to, to club, it, it, like it, it almost felt from the outside looking in at Leamy's path that he was borderline falling through the cracks as a coach, considering what you're saying there and how much of a presence that he's known to be within people who've, who've played with him and, and who have coached him. No, that would be the th- that would be the biggest I think um, error one would make on. I, this guy is unbelievably calculated, hugely driven, but has that I suppose um, I don't know as a tip cuteness or as a tip shyness or as a t- tip ruthlessness inside him uh, in the fact that he knows exactly what he wants, where he wants to get there, how he wants to get there. Would have a lot of. Uh, um, I suppose uh, self confidence but humility underneath it all and um, Dennis has a fantastic brain um, I love playing with him I I loved team meetings with him and I've been in contact with him since since both of us have, have retired and uh, all Dennis sought was an opportunity and he didn't uh, I think he was probably incredibly hurt by what happened in his early coaching probably career been not being given an opportunity uh, in Munster and uh, I think uh, that was probably the moment where okay well I'm on my own now I've got to make decisions for myself and he, he got an opportunity with Leinster and Leinster being the organisation they are incredibly smart and this they uh, they, they, they targeted because they knew this guy can go that huge value what Dennis Leamy now is but he's in the senior coaching group in Leinster so you mean I, I suppose with the big advantage for Munster is that he has a young family and I think he commutes from tip to to uh, to Dublin so that's a, a, a massive I suppose advantage for Munster but in terms of uh, I suppose weighing up it, it for me as a coach it's not an easy decision to leave Leinster They have a bit of a blank canvas Munster in terms of what the roles might be what will he do do you think or what's best suited to him? Uh, he suited to so many. Adrian, that isn't the issue. It's about getting the right people, I think. For me, then you can give them roles and responsibilities. But if you've got, you know what I mean, um, turkeys, it's hard to put a turkey to, 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 to lead something. And I'm not aiming that at anybody at all. I'm just saying that once you have the quality of person and Mike and Dennis, then they know the rugby inside out. Uh, it'll be very, very straightforward. Can I just ask you as well on the Roundtree piece, because I don't know we've sp- spoken to you since that's been confirmed. The, you went through something very similar yourself last year, obviously, in terms of moving from coach up to the big gig. Is it just a case of, like, he doesn't, he's worked around plenty of camps and he's seen all of it up close and personal, but doing the gig, is it just a matter of getting on with it and there's no amount of words that can replace actually doing it and that, by virtue of that, that a bit of patience is required from Munster fans? Yeah, I, I, I just think, too, that the guy is 51 years of age. He's in rugby all his life. He's in top-level rugby. Uh, he gets rugby. He understands what's required. What, what I'm learning in my role, too, it's about do the things that you're really good at and get the other people to do the things that you're not really good at, and then it works. But don't think you're really good at everything, because if you think you're really good at everything, you're not going to... You won't succeed. So, you mean, I think where I struggle, I suppose, is I'm really good in the short term, I think. But, like, in terms of people asking me for pre-season games, that doesn't interest me at the minute. And I put my hand up and I I said to my sporting director, can you have a look at that and get that boxed off for me? I think there's so many ways of doing it. And I said it comes back to, I suppose, having clarity in what your roles and responsibilities are. Once that's established, once you have secure people who want to share information, then you can kind of change lanes and cross ideas, and then it becomes very interesting. But I think Graham Rowntree from uh, from pure rugby pedigree, he's top class, and and as a bloke, I think he's top class, and and give this guy a, a chance, he'll be great. Good stuff. Thanks, William. Cheers. Thanks See you so. guys. Thank Ron you. On the line there from uh, La Rochelle. Interesting stuff on uh, Dennis Leamy and uh, the possibility of Mike Prendergast rocking up there sometime soon. It's suddenly be- 
sort of developing into a bit of a dream team, isn't it? Yeah, you obviously don't want to uh, jump out in front of it too quickly in case it doesn't happen. But the Leamy insights there are really interesting. And the reason why they're interesting is because uh, I'm probably guilty of not knowing a whole pile about his coaching career to date and not knowing enough about the man. And as Ronan said there, maybe Munster didn't make enough of the resource that they had in Leamy, who was keen to get into coaching. But maybe in the long run, that'll benefit Munster in, in an ironic way, given the fact that he's seen much more with grassroots systems in Ireland, has seen what it's like to be in the backroom team in Tipperary Hurling, yeah. obviously helped them to a 2016 All-Ireland win. That was S&C, wasn't it? Was that I'm, I'm not sure, I can't I'm remember. Sure I just I just remember being part of that uh, long list of backroom uh, um, uh, people involved in, in that squad. So he's had a very interesting post-playing career, and it does sound like he'd be quite the acquisition for Munster at the moment. Well, look at it. The, I think we might have spoken about this last week, but the similarities between it and Manchester United are not quite as stark, but certainly uh, you could put yourself in the position of being a, one of the rival supporters, let's say, and, you know, this looks like Munster getting their act together. All they need now, really, is to sign Mac Hansen. <laughs> shrewd, shrewd move on. Interesting point, though.